now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to The World Over. He is a distinguished actor, best known for his work as Detective Bunk Moreland in The Wire. You may also know him from Treme or The New Odd Couple on CBS. He's also a New Orleans native and author of a new memoir, The Wind in the Reeds, A Storm, A Play, and A City That Would Not Be Broken. In it, he chronicles his experience before and after Katrina, as well as the redemptive power of faith and art. I spoke with him earlier here in our D.C. studio. Here's my exclusive interview with Wendell Pierce. You grew up in Pontchartrain Park, yes. which is a beautiful enclave uh, near, the, near Pontchartrain, yeah, Lake but... Pontchartrain. You called it a Black Mayberry. Yeah. Tell people what it was like and what happened in Katrina. Um, uh, Pontchartrain Park is uh, one of those classic American neighborhoods. It was post-World War II, sort of Levittown, suburbia. Right. And Gentilly Woods was a white neighborhood. Right. And there was this ditch that separated us. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pontchartrain Park was the separate but equal. Mm -hmm. And I like to say, and uh, one of our pioneer um, neighbors said it, we took something ugly and made it beautiful, and it became an incubator for black talent. Dutch Morial, the first black mayor, mm -hmm. uh, the, um, his son, Mark Morial, who is uh, now the national president of Urban League, uh, yeah. Terrence Blanchard, uh, Grammy Award winner. Yeah, of course. Um, so it's historic. Um, you know, multi-denominational churches. Yes. Uh, you had, uh, you know, uh, Southern University at New Orleans. Mm -hmm. So it was a perfect place. But we were also in the deepest part of the flooding. Uh. And I knew that we owed it to our parents' generation who fought long and hard to make something beautiful like that, this Black Mayberry, where I could go anywhere. Mm. So that's why I went back to my neighborhood of Pontchartrain Park and started to rebuild. Now, you were an actor in New Orleans. Uh, mm. We both went to the New Orleans right. Center of Creative Arts, NOCA, which is this institution that it was in a simple simple building on Perrier yeah, Street for right. a long time uptown. Right. Now it's in this grand, fantastic Yes, I know. We never imagined. <laughs> I know. Um, but it, it really shaped you. You went on to Juilliard. Mm -hmm. You end up coming back post-Katrina mm -hmm. in 2007, and you're in the classic Waiting for Godot. Right. And it was staged in New York, but then it was restaged in New Orleans in the Lower Ninth Ward. Tell me about that production, because that is really the key that opens up a real understanding for you about the intermingling of art and faith and, and where you came from. Yeah, I, I realized that... Um 20 years from now, someone's going to ask, Mr. Pierce, what did you do in New Orleans' Darkest Hour? Mm -hmm. I was an actor. I wanted to respond with my art. And so with the Classical Theater of Harlem, we did Waiting for Godot with 15,000 gallons of water, a rooftop coming out of it, mm -hmm. and um, Estragon opening up, sitting on that rooftop, looking up. And it was every image we had seen that awful week of mm -hmm. Katrina. Um, and I weighed in through the water right. and my bags. And so it was, uh, it was an image that was so clear. And we did it in the Lower Ninth Ward, right where hundreds had died. Wow. And the play is about the desolation and the loss of these two men. They don't know who they are, where they came mm -hmm. from. And out of that desolation, they realize that they're waiting for Godot, someone outside of themselves, some entity outside of themselves, but they have to find it within themselves ultimately mm -hmm. to save themselves. That whatever they were looking for was already in them. That's yeah. ultimately where the classic play speaks to people. Depends, yeah. You know? And there was a, the most cathartic moment of my life in the, in the middle of that production where New Orleanians who had come from across the city, rich and poor, white and black, old and young, the lawyer and the longshoreman mm. uh, sitting next to each other, all affected by this great flood and disaster of New Orleans. And I turned to them in the play, and I just really was a... Um, a moment where I just stepped out of character and turned to the audience and said, at this place, in this, in this moment in time, all mankind is us. Let us do something while we have the chance. Mm. And it is in that moment where, it was, where we all realized it's on us. We have to do something. We have to do something, and we have to come back. And that was the thing that made me realize the power of what I was doing of that art. So many people to this day spoke to me and said, I've saw, I saw that and it gave me hope, it gave me vision. And it's that sort of transcendent nature of art that connected me to how we connect to our culture in New Orleans. Mm. It has always been a city and a place where uh, that intersection between life 
and pe the people in themselves, that intersection is our culture and art. It's tangible, it's real, it's not just ethereal, it's not just um, a piece of entertainment. And that sort of transcendence also awoke me to what spirit and spirituality is all about. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me how much that was a part of my life too. So that one cathartic moment reminded me of the power of art, mm. reminded me of the power of art and culture, specifically in New Orleans, how it was a thing of uh, revelation, it was a thing of rebellion, a thing of insurrection, mm. um, and also reminded me of the connection and the transcendent nature of, uh, in a brief moment that you can have, mortals can have, where they find some immortality and that transcendence is really about what f spirit is and it reminded me of the, 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 the journey that I have when it comes to my faith and my spirit. Yeah, I know, and, and the Catholic faith here of your mother mm -hmm. really pops on the pages of The Wind in the Reeds in, oh, yeah. a, in, a, in a tangible way. There's a line, you were just talking about New Orleans, there's a line near the end of the book where you write, the Bible tells us to walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Mm -hmm. New Orleans tells us, no, don't walk, pull out your handkerchief, raise high your parasol mm -hmm. and dance. Right. And that really is the right. spirit of the city that, right That is there. the spirit of the city. And you know, I tell people all the time, when you see a second line, remember it came out of, we have social aid and pleasure clubs. Yeah, you know, that's right. We understand the pleasure part. Oh, it's gonna be a good party, it's gonna be a good dance, it's gonna be good music. But people forget about the safe social aid part. They are benevolent associations. Mm -hmm came out of an ugly time where people couldn't get burial plots. They couldn't go to and get health care. They couldn't go and um, to a certain, and get insurance. So they pool their money in these social aid and pleasure clubs, mm -hmm. a benevolence association. Raymond, your daddy takes sick, we're going to take care yep. of you. Your mama passes away, we're going to send her off nice. Mm -hmm. You know, That's what a second line is about. That's what a jazz funeral is about. Mm -hmm. It was showing that the community pooling their resources to make sure to take care of you and mm. pooling their resources to make sure they take care of you in spirit yep. as well. Now, I, I wept many times reading this, certainly because oh. of the New Orleans connection, mm -hmm. but there is that pulsing heart of family and history that beats yes. through this whole book and through the city itself. And that people love the food, they love the music. That's just the overflow right. of the love and the family and the community that, that we know that I think people who are visiting or outsiders don't quite get a full picture right. of. This book gives you a much fuller picture of it, particularly the lived black experience mm -hmm. in New Orleans. From slavery, you talk about your, your, your right. great grandfather, grandfather right up until your mother, this educated woman, strong Catholic woman. Absolutely. Tell me about her, T. T, we, I, we called my mother T because my older brother grew up with my first cousins. So we had T. Evelyn and T. Vaughn oh. and T. May, all of these aunts, and the kids couldn't say Althea. Ah. So they just said T, hmm. and there's T. And so um, he called her T, and so when we came along, we said T as well. Saying, uh, yeah. My mother was, a devout Catholic, um, she loved the Blessed Mother. Mm. Um, I remember during Lent we would read, uh, we would say the rosary every night in my father's study. A family that prays together stays, stays together. together. That's right. Um, uh, my mother was also coming from the experience of African Americans and the ugliness of segregation mm -hmm. and racism. Uh, even the segregated always, church. Even the segregated church. We, we don't go to the church in our neighborhood because it was mm -hmm. over in Gentilly Woods. I know right, right where the, it is. And, uh, and when she first went there, they said, excuse me, the Negro pews are in the back. Mm. She sat in the, my mother and father. Any church in the world is going to be on the right side. The fifth, fifth row. Fifth row. <laughs> fifth pew. Um, and she said, I walked out of that church going towards the back. You know, and I kept walking. I said, we'll never go back there again. Mm. Um, and my mother, through that experience, and experiences that had happened to my grandmother, True. even worse, where, you know. But it's amazing they kept their faith through that. And, and, the, reason, so and, the, reason, and the reason was, my mother always said, there's that which is man-made and that which is divine. We go to the church to connect with the divine. Mm. And man is fallible. So we were never taught uh, to revere mm -hmm. 
the men and women of the church. Mm -hmm. You respected the men and women of the church because they made a, a, a commitment and, sure. um, and, and have been called by a vocation, but understand that they're fallible. Right. And we go to church to pray to God and to connect with that divinity. So we have always said, make that separation. Uh, uh, and it's like, it's the same way we deal with America, mm -hmm. you know, which is um, you love this country uh, and what this country uh, can be. And you have to challenge it at all the times when it doesn't live up to its own ideals. Mm -hmm. You know, I like to tell people it's like a drunken parent. I love you, but you got to stop drinking. Your, your mother had this, you talked about her great devotion and, and her great faith. Mm -hmm. You have a really important thing that happens in your life. In 2012, you're doing Treme, and you really get to spend those last years of her life with her. Uh, what did she yes. teach you in those moments? I, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. Um, Treme was a, a real godsend because mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't just a television show. Um, it was it was a, a therapeutic thing for the people of New Orleans. Yep. Um, but at the same time, I got to spend the last four years of my mother's life with her mm -hmm. and be home. And uh, I remember near the end, my mother told me, Wendell, I'm dying. I said, oh no, listen, you know, all we have to do is get you back in shape, feature. She said, Wendell, I'm dying. She said, you need to stay in church. You need to go to church. Hmm. I uh, am not a lapsed Catholic. Yeah. I am, uh, I, I have always been challenged with my faith ever mm -hmm. since I was a little boy, something that's mm -hmm. lifelong. My confirmation name is Thomas, ah. and I purposely picked Thomas, you know. I wanted, the doubter. You know, the doubter. Mm -hmm. I will, Explain um, it to me, let me touch. Yeah, mm -hmm. let me touch until I can touch his hand. But, and you, but you, and in that exchange, and, she told you, go, I want you to go to, ch go to church. And you yes. said, wait, I go to church. I go to church. And she said, no, I mean, really go to church. Mm -hmm. I, want you, I want you to understand that uh, I want you to go back to church and find, you know, mm -hmm. your spirit again. Um, so for my 50th birthday, with that in mind, I didn't want a big party or whatever. I said, I'm going to find, she loved the Blessed Mother. So I said, where, where were those visions? Oh, I thought of Guadalupe. I thought of uh -huh. different places. And I said, oh, no, Fatima. Ah. And my birthday is December 8th. Oh, the Immaculate, immaculate conception. conception. And it was on a Sunday that year. My 50th birthday. So I have this vision of going to Portugal and going to be And you go on alone field. on your 50th I go alone. Project. I wanted to go alone. And I realized I wanted to be with her. Hmm. Ultimately, I wanted to be with her. I knew this was the place. And I thought I had this vision of, you know, the three peasant children in the middle of a, a field. A beautiful field. Uh, and, you a know, and there's, going to be, there's going to be all of us going towards this pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. And I got there in this beautiful basilica. Mm -hmm with a hundred thousand people hmm. and I, I couldn't believe it and they, they take the, the Blessed Mother out once a year on they the, carry her they out. carry her out mm -hmm. for the procession and this was special because there was the Immaculate Conception it was on a Sunday mm. and so they brought her out mm. and as the procession is leading out I look as a New Orleanian and I see all the pilgrims raising their handkerchiefs in the air. Oh, wow. As they say, this was actually as the, after the Mass, they're bringing her back to her place, mm. waving goodbye to the Blessed Mother. And oh. in that moment, I knew that what I was really searching for was what my mother had asked me to search for. Find your faith again. I realized that I was also grieving. Mm. This is a year later after her death. And it was that moment that I knew that she was okay. Hmm. And that she was like, I've given you everything you need. I've taught you everything you need in life. Be the man that I expect you to be. And I could say goodbye to my mother finally. Hmm. I knew that's what the trip was all about. And that was what my pilgrimage was all it, about. In the book you say in that moment, she was telling me to keep the faith. I believe, T. Yes. I believe. Absolutely. She was telling me to keep the faith. And I do believe, mm -hmm. and uh, the, beautiful, the beautiful thing about it was uh, I knew then that there's an absolute presence to my mother. Mm. That was the thing. Mm -hmm. There wasn't an end to life. Yeah. 
there's an excellent, uh, an ongoing presence yeah. that my mother is in me and faith is in me and God is in me. I love how the book combines your art. It tells really your whole story and, and we can only do um, mm -hmm. touch on a, mm -hmm. a few of these details, but you've got to read the book. It really is a moving experience and certainly was for me. I love the connection you ultimately make between art and religion and how yes important, how dependent art is on religion. You have a great line, art is a kind of sacrament, you write, mm -hmm. a sacrament that induces within you an experience of transcendence, a connection to the eternal, and of unity with all humanity. Yeah, and that's the thing that I realized that when we speak about art, uh, we know what thoughts are to the individual when they lie awake at night and reflect on who they are, where they've been, mm -hmm. who they hope to become. The forum of art is where we as a community reflect on where we've been, where we've failed, where we've triumphed, where we hope to go, where we declare our values and then we act on them. Mm. And it's in that communal experience that we find transcendence in a cathartic thing that is a, the essential part of what faith is about mm. also. Mm. That it induces the behavior and in that brief moment we understand how we are most like our Creator, mm. and that we are all connected, and that mm. we have to tap into that to realize the transcendent nature of our experience. Yeah. And that is what spirit and faith is all about. Yeah, and how connected and, and, we all and, are. And, and, that, and I have to be reminded of that, that that happens in Mass. It is mm. that, yeah. you know, that, that, that it, bringing it's the, the communal, it, it is, all comes it is together. the Eucharist, you know? Yeah. And, um, and that's what um, art, was for me, and that's what the connection is to religion and faith. Yeah. More than anything, faith is for me. Well, you can, you certainly experience it in this book, and I've seen it in your great characters over the years, uh, and look forward to many more. Wendell, please. Really appreciate Thank it. you for being here. The Wind in the Reeds, a storm, a play, and a city that would not be broken is available by Wendell Pierce in bookstores everywhere and online.